Well, I deleted my Twitter account the other day, on Thanksgiving, actually. And I've been thinking about doing this for a long time, in fact. It was a very simple decision, in the end. I'd been on the platform for 12 years, and had tweeted something like 9,000 times. That's about twice a day, on average. So I wasn't the most compulsive user of Twitter, but it did punctuate my life far more than it should have. It was the only social media platform I ever used, personally. I don't run the accounts I have for Facebook and Instagram, and I never look at them. Anyway, the long and the short of it is that I just came to believe that my engagement with Twitter was making me a worse person. It really is as simple as that. I have a lot to say about Twitter and about what I think it's doing to society. But I left it because it suddenly became obvious that it was a net negative influence on my life. The most glaring sign of this, and something which I've been concerned about for a few years, is that it was showing me the worst of other people in a way that I began to feel was actually distorting my perception of humanity. I know people have very different experiences on Twitter. And if you're just sharing cute animal videos or giving self help advice, you probably get nothing but love coming back at you. But when you touch controversial topics regularly, as I do, especially when you're more in the center politically and not tribally aligned with the left or the right, you get an enormous amount of hate and misunderstanding from both sides. I know there are people who can just ignore everything that's coming back at them. I think Bill Maher and Joe Rogan are both like this. They just never look at their at mentions. But I didn't appear to be that sort of person. I could ignore everything for a time, but I actually wanted to use Twitter to communicate, so I would keep getting sucked back in. I would see someone who appeared sincerely confused about something I said on a podcast, and I'd want to clarify it. And then I would discover for the thousandth time that it was hopeless. So... Twitter for me became like a malignant form of telepathy, where I got to hear the most irrational, contemptuous, sneering thoughts of other people, a dozen or more times a day. But the problem wasn't all the hate being directed at me. The problem was the hate I was beginning to feel. Hate probably isn't the right word. It was more like disgust and despair. Okay, Twitter was giving me a very dark view of other people. And the fact that I believed, and still believe, that it's a distorted view wasn't enough to inoculate me against this change in my attitude. Even some of the people who are most committed to attacking me on the platform, I know that my impression of them was distorted by Twitter. I mean, there might be a few exceptions to this, but I believe that very few of my enemies on Twitter are anywhere near as bad as they seem to me on Twitter. There's just no way around it. Twitter was causing me to dislike people I've never met. And it was even causing me to dislike people I actually know, some of whom used to be my friends. Rather than say anything about why I was leaving on Twitter, I just deleted my account which I now realize made my leaving Twitter open to many interpretations. And within a few minutes of deleting my account, I began hearing from people who appeared genuinely worried about me. They saw all the hate I was getting, and they thought it must have driven me from the platform. And several worried I might have been having some kind of mental health crisis. The truth is, when I left Twitter, I wasn't seeing that much hate directed at me, because I had blocked so many people. I used to never block people. But when I discovered that the platform had become basically unusable, I installed a browser extension that allowed me to block thousands of haters at once. I had probably blocked 50,000 people on Twitter in my last week on the platform. It was like a digital genocide. I was seeing an especially idiotic or vicious tweet directed at me, and I would block everyone who had liked it. And at the time I thought, well, this is brilliant. Anyone who liked that tweet is by definition beyond reach. There is no reason why these people ever need to hear from me again. And I certainly don't need to hear from them. And it basically worked. 
So I wasn't seeing most of the hate that was being directed at me. I was seeing some of it, but it was totally manageable. But then I asked myself, how did I become the sort of person who is blocking people by the thousands who just happen to like a dumb tweet as though that one moment in their lives proved that all further communication on important issues was impossible? How did I begin to view people as intellectually and morally irredeemable? How did I begin to view myself as totally incapable of communicating effectively, ever, about anything, with these people? How did I give up all hope in the power of conversation? Twitter. I've also heard that many people are interpreting my leaving Twitter as an act of protest over what Elon is doing to the platform. In particular, his reinstating of Trump. It really wasn't that. I, mean, I do think Elon made some bad decisions right out of the gate. And Twitter did get noticeably worse, at least for me. But I'm actually agnostic as to whether he will eventually be able to improve the platform. I doubt he'll ever solve the problem I was having. But he might make Twitter better for many people. And he might make it a viable business. He certainly has the resources to keep at it, even if advertisers abandon Twitter for years. So my leaving Twitter wasn't some declaration that I know or think I know that Elon will fail to make Twitter better than it currently is. I have no idea what's going to happen to Twitter. Rather, the lesson I was drawing from Elon was not that he was making Twitter worse by making capricious changes to it. The lesson was how one of the most productive people of my generation was needlessly disrupting his own life and damaging his reputation by his addiction to Twitter. And this has been going on for years. Elon's problem with Twitter is different than mine was because he uses it very differently. He spends most of his time just goofing around but he is now goofing around in front of 120 million people. So, when he's high-fiving anti-Semites and election deniers, or bonding with them over their fake concerns about free speech, he doesn't appear to know or care that he's increasing their influence. In many cases, he might not have any idea who these people are. Of course, in others, like with his friend Kanye, he obviously does. There is something quite reckless and socially irresponsible about how Elon behaves on Twitter. And millions of people appear to love it. I should probably address the free speech issue briefly. There's a lot more to say about this, but before I left Twitter, I was noticing that people seemed really confused about what I believe about free speech. And Twitter being Twitter, it proved impossible for me to clear up that confusion. Many seem to think that I used to support free speech unconditionally, like when I was defending cartoonists against Islamist censors and their dupes on the left. But now I somehow don't support it, because I supposedly have Trump derangement syndrome. Well, first, I've always acknowledged that there is an interesting debate to be had about the role that social media plays in our society. And I'm not going to resolve that debate here by myself. But the fact is, No one has a constitutional right to be on Twitter. In my view, the logic of the First Amendment runs in the opposite direction. It protects Twitter's new owner, Elon, from compelled speech. The government shouldn't be able to force Elon to put Alex Jones back on the platform any more than it should be able to force me to put Alex Jones on my podcast. Of course, I get that social networks and podcasts are different. But Twitter simply isn't the public square. It is a private platform. And Elon can do whatever he wants with it. If we want to change the laws around that, well, then we have to change the laws. I understand and fully support the political primacy of free speech in America. And I'd like the American standard to be the global norm. That's why I think there shouldn't be laws against Holocaust denial or the expression of any other idiotic idea. And the First Amendment protects this kind of speech, at least in the United States. But there also shouldn't be a law, in my view, that prevents a digital platform from having a no-Nazis policy in its terms of service. 
because these platforms need effective moderation and standards of civility to function. They are businesses started by entrepreneurs, supported by investors who want to make money. They have employees with mortgages. They have to survive on ad revenue or subscriptions or some combination of the two. Without serious moderation, digital platforms become like 4chan, which is nothing more than a digital sewer. I'm told that even 4chan has a moderation policy. Hell itself probably has a moderation policy. So-called free speech absolutism is just a fantasy online. Almost no one really holds that position, even when they espouse it. The fact that Twitter's terms of service might have been politically slanted or not applied fairly, I totally get why that would annoy people. And I suspect Elon is improving that. But this simply isn't a free speech issue. No one has a right to be on Twitter. Again, if we want to change the laws around that, we're free to. I'm not sure how that would look, and it seems like it would have some pretty bizarre implications, but that's what we'd have to do. So, my argument for keeping people like Trump and Alex Jones off Twitter is a terms of service argument and directly follows from the deliberate harm they both caused on the platform in the past. Here are two men who knowingly used Twitter to inspire their most rabid followers to harass specific people, not just on Twitter, but out in the world. The fact that they might not have tweeted, please go harass this person, is immaterial. They knew exactly what would happen when they singled out specific American citizens for abuse and spread lies about them at scale to a fanatical mob. They could see the results of their actions. For years, people were getting doxxed and stalked and having their lives ruined for years. Nothing about this was hidden. Elon apparently agrees with me about Alex Jones and said he would never let him back on the platform. But he doesn't agree about Trump. Well, that's fine. I simply recommended that he have a terms of service in place for when Trump proves, yet again, that he is exactly like Alex Jones. And then I hope Elon will enforce his own terms of service. But the crucial point is that this isn't a case where sunlight is the best disinfectant. This isn't a question of opposing bad ideas with good ideas. This is not a case where what used to be misinformation is suddenly going to become new knowledge and we'll all be embarrassed that we first rejected it. This is a case where two men with enormous cult followings weaponized obvious lies for the purpose of ruining people's lives. It is not authoritarian or fascist for me to hope that a private platform like Twitter, would decline to enable that behavior in the future. But we do have a larger problem to deal with. It's still not clear what to do about the social harm of misinformation and disinformation at scale. Algorithmically boosted speech isn't ordinary speech, and many people don't see this. We have built systems of communication in which lies and outrage spread faster and more widely than anything else. Scale matters. Velocity matters. Lies that get tens of millions of people to suddenly believe that an election was stolen because they've been amplified by a digital outrage machine have a lot in common with shouting fire in a crowded theater. Contrary to what most people think, it's legal to shout fire in a crowded theater. But wouldn't we want the owner of the theater to remove a person who was doing that again and again and again? I'm not claiming to fully understand what we should do about all this. I've done several podcasts on and around this topic, and I'm sure I'll do many more, because the problem isn't going away. But being a so-called free speech absolutist at this point is nothing more than a confession that you haven't thought about the real issues. It's like being a Second Amendment absolutist, who can't figure out why people shouldn't be able to own cluster bombs or rocket launchers for home defense. 
technological change matters. We've been given new powers, and we're not quite sure how to wield them safely. And now, in the case of Twitter, we have a lone billionaire who is just turning the dials however he sees fit. Again, I recognize that he is totally free to do that. But I also happen to have an opinion about which changes will be for the good and which won't. And I get that many people are still seeing this all through the lens of COVID. In some ways, I am too, just from the other side. As I've said many times before, I view COVID as a failed dress rehearsal for something far worse. And I worry that we didn't learn much from it, apart from how bad we are at cooperating with one another, or even at having a fact-based discussion about anything now. And I do blame Twitter for much of that. But I also get that in Elon's hands, Twitter now seems to many people like a necessary corrective to all the ways in which our institutions failed us during the pandemic. It's like finally we've got someone powerful enough to call bullshit on the New York Times. In that respect, Elon is Trump 2.0. I understand that COVID changed everything for a lot of people. You know, the CDC and the WHO and many other public health institutions seriously lost credibility when they needed it most. I get that many of our scientific journals have been visibly warped by woke nonsense. I understand that COVID has been a moving target. And what seemed rational in April of 2020 was no longer rational in April of 2022. And many people and institutions couldn't adjust. I understand that the effects of school closures were terrible in most cases. I get that many of our policies around masks proved ultimately ridiculous. Of course I understand that the sight of politicians being utter hypocrites during the various lockdowns was infuriating. People literally couldn't hold funerals for their loved ones who died in isolation, while Governor Hairgel was holding a fundraiser at French Laundry. I totally agree that having a pharmaceutical industry driven by bad incentives and windfall profits is dangerous and reduces public trust in medicine. I know that the lab leak hypothesis was always plausible and never racist. I get that the risk-benefit calculations for the mRNA vaccines change, depending on a person's age and sex and other factors. And I've spoken about most of these things many times on this podcast. But the deeper point is that all of this confusion and institutional failure does not even slightly suggest that we'll be able to navigate the next public health emergency with everyone just quote, doing their own research and tweeting links at each other. And this is where I've been at odds with many people in the alternative media space. Rather than work to improve our institutions and identify real experts, it's like we're witnessing the birth of a new religion of contrarianism and conspiracy thinking, amplified by social media and the proliferation of podcasts and newsletters, and now the whims of the occasional billionaire. The bottom line is that we need institutions we can trust. We need experts who are, in fact, experts, and not just vociferous charlatans. And many of us have lost trust in institutions and experts. Again, far too often for good reason. That's a tragedy. And I've spent a lot of time on this podcast analyzing that tragedy and worrying about its future implications. However, many people are now behaving as though nothing important has been lost. In fact, they're celebrating the loss of valid authority, as though the flattening of everything and the embarrassment of the so-called elites is a pure source of entertainment. These people are frolicking in the ruins of our shared epistemology. And one of the people doing the most frolicking is Elon. The fact that our collective loss of trust has often been warranted doesn't suggest that we aren't paying a terrible price for it, or that the price won't rise very steeply in the future. When it comes time to decide which medicines to give our children, or which wars to fight, there is simply no substitute for trust in institutions 
and experts. The path forward, therefore, is to create the conditions where such trust is possible and actually warranted. In the media, in government, in pharmaceutical companies, everywhere that actually matters. That is not a path where we just tear it all down. That is not a path where we just promote any outsider, no matter how incompetent and malevolent, simply because he is an outsider. We are not going to podcast and substack and tweet our way out of this situation. Anyway, when I look at my own life, and when I look at the controversies and fake controversies that have caused me personal stress and damaged relationships, when I look at the analogous moments in the lives of friends and colleagues and former friends and colleagues, when I look at what makes it so difficult to communicate about basic facts in our society, so much of this conflict and confusion appears to be the result of Twitter. And the truth is that even when Twitter was good, it was making me a more superficial person. Its very nature is to fragment attention. Of course, that sometimes feels great. I was following hundreds of smart and funny people, and they were often sharing articles and other media that I really enjoyed. Twitter was a way of staying in touch, or seeming to stay in touch, with what's happening in the world. And that's one reason why so many people are addicted to it. But even this began to seem like a degrading distraction. Even the best of Twitter was an opportunity cost, because it diverted my attention from more important things. Twitter was making it harder, not easier, to do what I truly value, to read good books, to write, to meditate, to enjoy my family, to work on this podcast. And now that I've stepped away from it, I feel that it was definitely a mistake to spend so much time there. 